Thanks, everyone. What a great turnout for this evening's conversation. And a lot of phones raised up as well. <laughs> we love your phones. <laughs> uh, Eva Chen, head of fashion partnerships at Instagram. Everything in your background suggests that your being head of fashion in, uh, fashion partnerships at Instagram was kind of inevitable, uh, ranging from your internship at Harper's Bazaar to your years at Teen Vogue, Elle, and Vogue China. David mentioned uh, editor in chief at Lucky Magazine. You were the youngest editor in chief at Condé Nast. Uh, you were an Instagram influencer before you joined Instagram. <laughs> so. When I look at your bio, it's inevitable. It didn't start that way, though, because you were pre-med at Johns Hopkins, yeah. and you did a stint at Cravath, Swain, and Moore as yes. an M&A paralegal. Yes. People are saying, what? Yes. <laughs> I've done everything, like literally everything. I think the only pre I wasn't, because I was pre-med, pre-law, I was never like pre-engineer, which I kind of regret in life. Uh, and I was never like pre-veterinary sciences. But everything else, like I was a philosophy major at one point. I was a psychology major. Um, I was a Latin major at one point, which like made no sense. But it's funny that you say inevitable. Like in my career, I actually never had a roadmap. I never had a plan. I always just kind of followed what I was interested in and followed my passion. So whether that was beauty or whether it was writing or whether for lucky it was shopping, you know, I always just kind of followed that and everything just ended up the way it ended up. So your passion turned into your profession. Mm -hmm. Have either of those or those early experiences, whether it was being a Latin major, a philosophy major, pre-med, um, a paralegal, has that been useful to your work as mm -hmm. an editor-in-chief of Lucky or at Instagram? Does it I, influence what you do now? Yeah, I actually think, you know, so I, I don't think there's any wasted exper experience in life. I think that no matter what you do, if you take a job and you hate it, um, and honestly, like being working as a paralegal in a law firm was not the best fit for me. Like, I think you should only be a lawyer if you really want to be a lawyer. Okay, like don't do it and don't be a doctor because for me, I was watching ER and I was like, oh my God, George Clooney, like all the doctors, like probably are gonna look like that. They don't. Um, <laughs> they don't, for the record. There are like, very few McDreamies, but like, you know, for me, I feel like there was no wasted experience. Like when I was pre-law, I was working in mergers and acquisitions for like 110 hours a week. I remember I used to sleep under my desk. I learned to be really quick with paperwork and really have a good attention to detail, like you know, redacting and kind of like going through a mm -hmm. lot of um, paperwork. And when I was an assistant in a magazine at, at, at Harper's Bazaar, or I mean at um, Elle Magazine, it wasn't that different. It was just like a different topic matter. So I feel like no matter what you do in life, like try to accentuate the positive. And I always tried to see like, okay, what skill set am I going to take from this? Even though the subject matter is not of interest to me, like what will I take to my next job? And I think that's, for me at least, I think that's kind of served me well. Okay, so you experimented and tried out different things. When you entered the magazine world, that's where it stuck. And that's yeah. where you found your home, your tribe, everyone. You grew up a magazine junkie, so yes. this was a natural course of action for you. At what point did you become acutely aware of the intersection between and opportunities between fashion and, and digital tech? Is there one uh, event or trend that really turned it for you? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, when I was a beauty editor, I would go to like probably 10 to 20 beauty events a week. Where, where literally I would be going to a breakfast, there'd be a dermatologist talking about like all the different ways free radicals affect your skin. And I would literally be taking notes and I would think like literally two sentences of what this woman is saying, if anything, is going to make it into the story I'm writing about mm -hmm. skincare. And I remember thinking like, well, I wish there was a place for me to put all this extra information. Or I would be at an event for the launch of a mascara and they would have a trapeze artist literally like flying through the air to represent the wings that your lashes would have. It was something like kind of ridiculous but amazing at the same time. And I remember like having in the in back then like you know an I like a phone that was like this big and like was like doo 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 like it was like old school. And I remember thinking like this is so great. I wish my like the readers of the magazine I was working at could see what it's like to be a beauty editor. So when Instagram came around, it just became this visual kind of like, I don't want to say dumping ground because it sounds kind of like negative, but I literally just put like everything on there. Like 
the MAC cosmetics products that I knew that we weren't shooting, I would just put it on my Instagram. The nail polishes, the nail art that didn't, outtakes that from the shoot that I did with Jinsu and a nail artist, like I would put that on my Instagram. And so it kind of became this place where I put all this extra information and I realized because I started getting a following, like people really were interested. Mm -hmm. And people were interested in what there was out there beyond just the pages of the magazine. Of course they looked forward to the issue every month, but they just wanted more. So that kind of was the light bulb moment for me. It was like a behind the scenes commentary for a DVD yeah, or something. Exactly. Like you always love the bloopers, right? Like when you're watching a movie, you know, and like at the end of the movie, there's always like Jonah Hill falling on his face or Channing Tatum doing a funny dance. Like that's what people always like. And for me, it was like, like Instagram kind of became my place where I put just everything extra. And um, I'm, I mean, I'm still doing that now to a certain degree. Now, you began doing this Eva Chen pose. It's a hashtag, everyone knows about it, right? Where Eva takes a picture of her shoes and yes. her bag on, in the back of a taxi. When did you start doing it and when did you notice other people were doing it and following you? Okay, so I started doing this pose basically because I have a lot of friends who are bloggers and like actual real influencers. Like they are influential. And as so opposed to you? As I'm like a normal human being, but they would be standing <laughs> and they'd be standing on like the, a mountain in like Nepal and they'd be looking into the distance <laughs> and they would all have that one wave of hair, you know, going over their face and their face would have perfect makeup and they literally just looked like perfect all the time. And I remember thinking like, well, God, that's like not my life. Like every morning, it's like I throw on whatever I can. I'm always late, always running late. And I would just hop in a taxi. So, and the, the, the things that I was, I love bags and shoes. I was like, well, I always have shoes on, thank God. And then I would almost always change my purse every day. And I always have like food in my bag. I'm like a food hoarder. Like I literally hit the snacks here so hard on the way. <laughs> like when I walked in here, I was like, <laughs> and then I said to my Facebook and Inst my Instagram coworkers, I was like, this must be what people feel like when it's they come true. to Instagram. I saw this happen. I saw and this I happen. literally like started like taking tea bags and I started like took an Asian pear, like such exotic fruit here. It's like <laughs> so diverse here. It's wonderful. And so, you know, I always have food in my bag. And so basically I started doing this thing that's like makeup could be busted slash no makeup. Hair is probably in a messy top knot, probably wearing like jeans and like a, a sweater if like if that's pretty pulled together, but <laughs> shoes and bag on point. So I started taking pictures of it every day. Now I actually have to give credit where credit is due. My, co my now coworker, Christy Dash, who's sitting in the audience, raise your hand, raise it. <laughs> okay, so Christy actually, I was trying to think of a hashtag and I tried everything. I tried taxi shoe fee, like sh cabbie shoe fee, like it, terrible things. And Christy just started trolling me and hashtagging Eva Chen pose, Eva Chen pose and saying like, just do it. And then peop other people started doing it and I just gave in and was like, fine, I'll just, I'll do it. And it's like, I think 20,000 posts later on Instagram. And it's like, I love it because now on Instagram you can follow hashtags. So I can see people like from around the world participating and then I can comment with them and start kind of like digital friendships and encourage them on, so yeah. And again, this happened before you joined Instagram. Talk to us a little bit about how you got to Instagram because I understand your obsession with The Bachelor played a critical role here. I am super obsessed with The Bachelor. Just, and, I mean, we're at Bloomberg, it's super serious. I, I saw one person clap her hands. It's like me and this one girl, like love The Bachelor. But so for me, like I just, like I put everything on my Instagram, whether it's a Bachelor obsession to my child vomiting all over me, to whatever it is, it's like, a pretty open kind of conversation on my Instagram. And I remember, well, first I met Kevin Systrom at uh, an event and we chatted. And then um, I, in my interview, actually spent like, it was like a one hour long interview and we spent 50 minutes talking about The Bachelor. Five zero minutes. Five zero. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was like the best interview I've ever done in my life. I like walked out of that interview and my husband was like, how did your interview go? And I was like, we talked about The Bachelor and like, the rose ceremony for 50 minutes. And he was like, is that a good thing? And I'm like, I don't know. And he was like, well, what did he ask you about strategy? I'm like, um, well, I talked about the contestants and what their strategy should be <laughs> to win. And maybe that helped me get the job. I don't know. I mean, I do think in general, I'm like very passionate about Instagram. I think before I started working at Instagram, I was that editor that knew a lot about Instagram. Mm -hmm. So like makeup artists would stop me backstage and be like, we hear you know about this Instagram thing. Like, what should I be doing? And like um, models like Carly Kloss would be like, should I join Instagram? And I'm like, yes, you should. <laughs> and that was before I started working there. So I, I, I working here. So I do feel like 
part of it's like if you love what you do, I, I do think that's like the secret to like success. You know? And you kind of invented this job because head of uh, fashion partnerships is not something that existed before you came onto the scene. Did you invent it or did Instagram invent it for you? How did you guys come up with just figuring out the contours yeah. of the job? Well, the Instagram team was a lot smaller when I started. Um, and basically, they, there were two people who oversaw all of Instagram partnerships globally. So I can only imagine like what their inboxes must have been from like everyone asking for Instagram help. And so uh, one of my now coworkers, Charles, was like, we've been thinking about adding this position. Like, what do you think? And I had just had a baby. I was exhausted. It was like a very like stressful time in my life. And I was like, I don't know, like kind of just want to hang out and like, you know, like cuddle my baby. And he was like, this is the perfect job for you. And I was like, I don't know. And my husband was like, this is the perfect, like everyone just kept saying, this is the perfect job for you. And I was like, this is the perfect job for me. Um, and so I am the first kind of vertical specific hire, but there's like a me of music, there's a me of news, there's a me of like teens because it's mm -hmm. growing so quickly on Instagram. So um, I mean, Instagram is 800 million people now, 300 million a day on stories. So it's it's large. It's a growing audience, clearly. Yes. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what the job entails and what it doesn't include, because I think there's some confusion over whether you are the person who signs up brand X or brand Y to be an advertiser on Instagram. Yeah, so I actually work um, specifically on editorial, like the organic Instagram as we call it. So I help models, designers, stylists, fashion magazines, fashion journalists, anything that really touches fashion, like my role is to help them tell their Instagram story better. You know, there's so many ways to tell your story on Instagram now. There's video, there's um, posts, there's stories, there's live, there's live with. I mean, it, there's just so many different things to use now and a lot of people just need a specific kind of just a little bit of help. So mm -hmm. my job is just basically to be like an Instagram counselor and just to help them out a bit. So a sounding board, you give them tips, you exactly. tell them how to connect with the different tools yeah. and how to connect with the audience better. Exactly. Do you ever sit in on the meetings on the business side where the guys who do sign up uh, companies no, and sponsors? Not, not really. Um, I don't really work on that side but what I do do that I love is I also surface feedback. So. A fashion photographer might say, hey, it's like, we love this square, but it's really hard because when we're shooting ad campaigns or when we're shooting a spread for Vanity Fair or we're shooting a cover for Vogue, we don't want to crop it into a square because we're missing like one quarter of the detail. Mm -hmm. So I surface feedback like that to back to the, what we call the product team. Mm -hmm. And the product team will then kind of create things like portrait and landscape on Instagram, which is a, a something that they did as a direct result of getting feedback from fashion photographers. So have you proposed filters, for instance? Well, like when Stories was launching, I was pretty involved in kind of giving feedback on like, we really need like fun filters. People want to look like a kitten. They do, <laughs> um, you know, and kind of making sure that the fun factor was there and also that it was just easy to use. Like the fashion community has taken so well to Instagram. It's like so many of the best, I think, creative uses of Instagram come from fashion. So the team at Instagram is so great. They're so smart and they want to hear feedback. So it makes my job easy to give them feedback. Okay, there are Instagram influencers who make a living by building up their audiences and then they sell product placements or at least they accept um, free products to post about, mm -hmm. which don't always seem to be disclosed. It's not really clear where the line is drawn. How do these influencers um, successfully manage that transition to monetizing their audience while preserving some authenticity? It's, yeah. it's a fine line. Totally. Um, it's interesting because I think a lot of people talk now, and I think the word influencer is definitely a buzzword, right? Like people love saying influencer this, influencer that. I think in, in, like influencers have always existed. Like you know, Mar Marilyn Monroe was an influencer in her own way. Like Audrey Hepburn or Givenchy, you know, and. She was a Givenchy and like, you know, branded content ambassador, you know, in her own way. And I think what it is now is just that there's this huge ripple effect when someone with a following of 15 million wears something. And I think to me, the people who do it best are the ones who are taking partnerships with brands that they love anyway and they talked about even when they weren't getting paid millions of dollars to do it. And I also think it's one of the reasons why Instagram launched a branded content tool where Instagram influencers or celebrities or athletes can disclose paid partnerships. Mm -hmm. So you'll see on the very top, it'll say um, influencer X in partnership with Land Rover, you know, so that they can be extra transparent. I find, at least from my experience um, from and from talking to many of the influencers, is that their followers actually appreciate the transparency and they extra appreciate it. And as long as the content doesn't feel super out of place, like suddenly holding up a cup that's like, 
My favorite tea is fit tea, <laughs> which it's not, by the way. My favorite tea is green tea, honey ginseng. It's very good, but like not hashtag branded content. But like, you know, it's like when it feels like themselves, like that's the most important thing. And I think whether we're talking about like, you know, an advertisement or a branded content play on Instagram or a regular post, when you are like true to yourself and you like just are authentic, that's the most important thing. So when it's consistent with who you are and yeah. your brand already, exactly. it matters to people then. Totally. Okay. Do, does print media play a role at all in what you do? I mean, you came from the world of magazines, yeah. you've left it. D does it play a role in, in your view of fashion and how it expands from here? Definitely. I mean, I think print media, like Vogue magazine is one of the hugest accounts on Instagram. You know, I think it has 20, someone look it up really quickly. I think it's like 20 million followers-ish. And I think um, they're doing an amazing job. They do a lot of original content on their Instagram. When they have large events and they do Instagram stories, they do a really great job. I think that for coming from print, like I still love print. I still subscribe to a lot of magazines. I look forward to getting New York Magazine like every week, for instance. I have a neighbor who steals mine. It drives me crazy. But I look forward to it and get very angry when I was about to say the fifth floor steals it. I'm pretty sure it's the fifth floor. But anyway, <laughs> like, pretty sure it's that guy. So, um, like, you know, I do think there is a place, it's like, you know, there is a place for print media. I think it, people still want to be on the cover of Vogue. It denotes a certain authority and a you've made it in mm -hmm. fashion, right? So I think that absolutely there is an interplay. And I, we work very closely with a lot of the photographers I worked with when I was at Condé Nast, with a lot of the models I worked with at Condé Nast. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship, I think. So it's a partnership for now, but as magazines get thinner and thinner, I mean, we've all noticed it. The pages are no longer so glossy, and everything's kind of stripped down and pared down. How do you see it playing a role in the next five years? Could they become competition and enemy? I don't think so, because I think if you look at Vogue, it's like, they now have an audience of 20 million when they originally had a circulation of about like 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, Anna is incredibly perceptive and like a lot of the editors, like Laura Brown from InStyle is doing a great job as well where they understand how to harness Instagram to broaden their reach. Um, Instagram is not trying to replace magazines. It is a platform for magazines to grow on and to grow their audience and to have their content be seen by, you know, up to like, 800 million people around the world so that someone in Tokyo can read American Vogue or In Style or Harper's Bazaar US and feel like they're part of the conversation there. All right, and it's Anna, not Anna. I've been saying it wrong it's, this whole it's, time. It's Anna. I call her Anna because I'm American. And I'm, you're true to yourself. And I'm true to myself. Um, <laughs> and she calls me Ava, even though my name's Eva. So oh, I feel no. like maybe it's like <laughs> quid pro quo. I don't know. All right, good to know, good to know. Let's talk a little bit about fashion overall. It's not static. It's a living, breathing organism that reflects and responds to current events, uh, whether it's the divisive political environment, whether it's the rise of teen activism that we've been seeing, the surging stock market, um, the increased influence of emerging markets like China. What do you think fashion is telling us right now about the current cultural moment? What's the message? I think the message is you must be inclusive and you must kind of understand that th there are billions of people on this planet and there's no not one look. I look um, I think about Instagram and some of the accounts that have done so well on Instagram and some some of the models that are coming out of it like Ashley Graham or Paloma SLR or Halima like these are women who represent beauty for a lot of different people and that kind of cookie cutter look it's it's not it's there's not just one standard of beauty it's 800 million standards of beauty. So I think that's kind of the voice and now you know, you think about it, if a fashion show were to cast just one type of model or one type of woman in their runway and it was every single model looked the same, you would hear about it on Instagram. Like, people will not take that. Um, and I think it's amazing. I think it's powerful. I think it's everyone can feel represented. And for me growing up, I remember not seeing anyone who looked like me or looked like us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like, it, it was just, it just didn't exist. And I think now if you are a 15-year-old bookworm who, you know, loves to read, this is like, I'm describing myself, like a bookworm <laughs> who loves to read young adult fiction and drink like lemon ginger tea, you know, it's like you can find someone else and you can find your group of people by following the hashtag bookstagram. You know, you can find like your kind of like squad and even if it's a digital squad, you can feel like you have other people to kind of identify with. How is fashion able to get ahead of the curve of everyone else? Why were they able to, to figure this out more quickly than others? I mean, I think in so many ways, like, you know, um, 
fashion just kind of, it's supposed to be a little bit prescient. It's supposed to be a little bit ahead of the curve. And also you're able to push the boundaries in fashion. Like, you know, like there are model, there are runway shows where people can kind of walk backwards on the runway or they, they cast real life models, a real life people, real life people, which is just like people, revolutionary, you know, like on the runway. And I, and I think that you're able to take risks in fashion and risks are appreciated. Some risks don't pay off. I mean, I, I think of um, H&M and the controversy over a black child modeling a sweatshirt with the words coolest monkey in the jungle. That obviously did not work. How is the feedback now from consumers different in the age of social media where something like that will go viral in a bad way very quickly? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I, I listen, I don't know what the thinking was behind that specific moment but or behind that specific casting, but nowadays it's like, the most important thing for corporations and companies is to have representation. Mm -hmm. Make sure that your board of directors is diverse. Make sure that the people who work in the casting department and the creative teams are diverse because you want to be able to truly represent and truly embody. It's not enough to say, we believe in diversity. You have to have diversity. Um, and that's, I feel very fortunate at Instagram. It's like, it is a diverse team. I love seeing like, and hearing the different voices and opinions and voices of dissent as well. And that's the thing with Instagram. It's like, People have opinions. You won't always agree with the opinions, mm -hmm. but it's important that people voice their opinions and when people see something that they think is wrong or that is wrong, like they will speak up and speak out. Right, do you think fashion brands are nimble enough to respond or it's because of something like Instagram that provides that instant loop, that feedback I loop they're some, able to? I think some of the, I think some companies are. I think it very much depends on the infrastructure of the company and this is like, I don't know enough about like fashion corporations and in infrastructure, but like if you have, I look at Gucci, for instance, and Gucci, um, you know, they have been known to collaborate with a lot of Instagram influencers and artists, and for the most part, 99% of the time, it's amazing. And there was one season where they did a, they, there was something on the runway that was was very evocative of Dapper Dan, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the renowned kind of like fashion icon, um, and they were called out for it. And very quickly, they issued a statement saying like, you were right, and now they're collaborating with Dapper Dan and doing a whole collection together. And I think that's in part, uh, their creative director, Alessandro, is incredibly fluent in Instagram. He's on direct messages, reaching out to illustrators, looking for fresh voices. And I think a lot of it depends on the leadership and how, um, I don't wanna say woke, but like how kind of like tuned in they are to what the public consciousness is craving. And how engaged they are as and well. And how engaged they are, exactly. I mean, I remember hearing a story from um, uh, Jade Fish, who is, her Instagram is Mrs. Jade Fish, and she's an Instagram illustrator. And she was saying that, like, she, she's an illustrator. She, I think, had less than 20,000 followers. And she got a direct message from Alessandro, and basically she was like, Eva, you have no idea. Like, the six months before, I'd been standing in the rain outside of a Gucci show on my honeymoon, taking pictures with my camera of the people leaving the Gucci show. I got a direct message from Alessandro asking me to his studio. I didn't even know who he was because his Instagram is kind of anonymous. It's just Lalo25. It's not anonymous anymore. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he reached out to her, invited her into his studio, and she did an illustration that ended up on one of his skirts, and she was sitting front row next to Stephen Klein, you know? Mm. And for her, it's kind of like an Instagram fairy tale, but I do feel like those moments happen so frequently now, and Instagram's been this great place of creative germination and flourishing and people just kind of launching their careers. I hear from like fashion, small fashion businesses every day that kind of launch their career, like launch an Instagram page and then they take off, you know, because they are creating creative um, kind of like different product from everyone else. And that makes me feel really good. And of course the different perspectives that different kinds of people bring all, exactly. and enhance that. Yeah. I think of Virgil Abloh, who was named uh, Louis Vuitton's first ever African-American artistic director. Uh, he's an example of the diversity, not just on the runway, yeah. but behind the scenes as well. Do you think a designer's Instagram presence and following, in this case, I think Abloh has 1.6 million followers, right. should that be a consideration for the houses that hire them? I don't think it needs to be like predicated on your Instagram following. I think for Virgil, He's incredibly creative. He understands the moment right now. And the way he shares on Instagram is really inspiring. Like he'll share 
his luggage coming off the conveyor belt, but somehow he makes it interesting. You know, he shares the matcha tea. He's like really into matcha tea. Like that's what I'm gonna send him to congratulate him, like maybe a tin of matcha tea. But he's like super, like he'll share the matcha latte he's getting. And I think that feeling of accessibility is what is so fresh to people. Um, and for his line off white, it's like, oh my God, people are like fanatics for that line. And it's like, it's because he puts like a unique take on something that's as like simple as a t-shirt, you know, and you just feel like his point of view is there. Um, and so I don't know that a fashion house needs someone to have like a trillion Instagram followers, but listen, it can't hurt, you know, to have that additional platform. But doesn't that hurt the fashion house sometimes as well? Because it creates a bigger celebrity out of the artistic director, out of the person who likes matcha tea more than a connection to the brand. Pretty sure the Vuitton brand will be okay. Like, <laughs> pretty big. Um, I do think, you know, you don't know the cross-pollination of audiences. Like, the 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 fashion house's audience could be a different one. A more, like, it might be an older consumer. Like, Virgil's followers largely are young adults, like I would hazard a guess to like 13 to 24, mm. you know, it's like a younger kind of audience. It's a super obsessed with streetwear, kind of like sneakerhead type audience. Um, I got a pair of his sneakers recently and there was a tag on them. And I literally like stared at this tag for like an hour. Cause I was like, if I cut this tag that says made in China off, am I destroying like <laughs> a, an original pair of off white sneakers? And literally, like, so I cut it off, and then people were, like, like direct messaging me and saying, like, my husband literally just screamed for 40 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know. I'm sorry. So then I direct messaged Virgil, and I was like, did I do the right thing? And he was like, it's choose your own adventure. And I was like, okay, blessed by Virgil. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. What do you think fashion is telling us about uh, the economy? Does it reflect the economy? Because you think of those stories where uh, people buy lipstick in, in tough economic times, or the hemlines of skirts uh, go up or down depending on how the economy is doing. They go up or down when the economy is, I think Supposedly they go down. Supposedly they go up. up? Yeah. Oh, Less material, I think. Oh, ooh. Yeah. Learn something new. I think that right now it's a really creative, it's, listen, it's tough times for retail, but it's also a really creative time if you're if you are a small business owner and you are using Instagram or you are using ways to talk to your customer directly, it can be a great time. So I look at Warby Parker, I look at Everlane, I look at all these companies, a lot of companies that I discovered on Instagram. I discovered like a company today, it's not this mug, but it's like it keeps your mug the exact temperature you want it to be. And I found it through Instagram. Like I actually got served an ad for this ceramic teacup. I'm like, they know me really well. Like, um, and I think I'm going to order one. It's eighty dollars, which is kind of a lot for a teacup. But well, I think speaking I'm of do knowing it. you really well, yeah. I got to ask you about data because there's a backlash against Facebook, social media in general. It's not just Facebook. But Facebook most recently because of the revelations of Cambridge Analytica using Facebook data of more than fifty million users before the 2016 election. Are people on the platform aware that Facebook owns Instagram, that it's the same company? I honestly, I honestly don't know. I don't think the average consumer knows because I've been in situations where people will say like, wait, like Facebook owns Instagram. I will say that like I work specifically for Instagram, specifically for fashion, so I don't have a ton of visibility into the Cambridge Analytical situation. I will say that like working in the building in general, like. I know that like the entire team was horrified by what happened, and I know that the team at Facebook is taking it extremely seriously. And I mean, I know Mark posted, Mark Zuckerberg posted about it. He took out ads in newspapers this weekend. It is like the company's number one concern, mm -hmm. and so they're really working on it. But um, yeah, beyond that, I wish I wish I knew more. Are you seeing any reaction from the fashion community, whether it's guys who are advertising or mm -hmm. any of the influencers? Honestly, uh, no. <laughs> The questions I get are, how many hashtags should I be using? <laughs> and um, how do I get more followers? And uh, how, do, like, literally, it's like business as usual. Fair enough, but how much overlap is there between Facebook and Instagram? Well, Instagram has a whole separate leadership team. So Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger, it's, it's pretty much a separate team. So um, it's, we sit in a different area of the building as well. And headquarters in Menlo Park, it's like a whole different compound. So it is run. Quite separately. Okay, it's run separately. I, I think about how Facebook is constantly being tinkered with, whether it's the news feed or something else. Is there a similar amount of tinkering when it comes to Instagram's interface? 
Yeah, well, the, I think the Instagram team and the product team, they're always testing new ways to improve the experience for people. So uh, there are always, like, there are things, like there's sometimes features that are launched in different countries, and they're testing it out before they launched it. Like Instagram Stories, I think, launched in a few markets before it came out. Shopping, which just rolled out to a larger market, mm -hmm. was tested in like different audiences before, just in the US, and now it's launched, I think, in eight countries. So they're always testing new ways to kind of improve the experience for people. You bring up stories, um, and when we, when we talk about backlash, I wonder if there's any repercussions to Instagram launching or stealing, some might say, some of the features from other places like Snapchat. Instagram Stories is very reminiscent of, mm -hmm. say, disappearing videos or disappearing photos on Snapchat. Do you see any repercussions from that? Do people hold that against Instagram in yeah, any way? I feel like, what, I remember when Instagram Stories launched, Kevin, you know, did an, uh, an interview, I think it was in the New York Times, talking about how, you know, yes, it was definitely an homage to Snapchat, and how feed, like, Facebook didn't invent the feed kind of concept either. Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's like taking something and changing it and making it right for that platform. So for Instagram, the main reason why people love Instagram stories, I think, is because there's scale there. It's 300 million people using it every day. I know that for me, it's like my views on my Instagram stories are very, I mean, I actually, full disclosure, have not posted to my Snapchat in a really long time. But Do you the, have a Snapchat account? I did. I, I don't even remember like the password. I haven't logged in in a long time. But because Instagram Stories makes it so easy, where it's like it's just seamless for me to go between Instagram Stories and Instagram like mm -hmm. to post. So like for instance, like walking coming here, it's like I was doing kind of behind the scenes videos and like green room and me stealing snack. I take borrowing snacks from downstairs. <laughs> consuming like, snacks. Consuming snacks, like the little, little one piece of dark chocolate that I took, like that my that someone from my team was like, eat this chocolate now, because like you need to get your blood sugar up, you know. Um, so, you know, you'll see that on my Instagram stories and then on my Instagram feed it'll be something different, you know. So to be able to kind of toggle between the two so seamlessly and then having the ability to do Instagram live and do live widths has been really fun. If there's an observation that Facebook can make people feel bad about themselves, and this is something that Mark Zuckerberg has addressed, does Instagram consciously try to move in another direction? Instagram has a whole team. Um, I think it's called the it's it's the well-being team, and they basically their entire focus is focusing on the well-being of the community, um, making the community a safer place, a place where people feel good is a huge priority for Instagram. I would say one of the top priorities for the company. And so with that in mind, whether it's a campaign like Kind Comments, encouraging people to leave kind comments on other people's Instagrams, or working on a campaign called Perfectly Me with Seventeen Magazine, where we want people to feel good in their own skin. Um, actually, I think it's in France or Germany where there's a hashtag that's called Acne is Normal mm -hmm. that I love, um, where people literally post pictures of themselves. If they have pimples, they don't cover it up. I think that's great. You know, I think the most important thing is that people feel comfortable and safe to express themselves on Instagram, and it's something the team takes really seriously. Is that something Instagram generates on its own, or did that happen organically? It, it's happened both ways. Like Instagram has partnered, like with Seventeen, we partnered with Seventeen to create that kind of movement, mm -hmm. um, and you know, help them amplify it and help them find a way to, because they wanted to do something for their followers, who are obviously all young women. Um, and basically, it's helping them brainstorm something like that. Um, but the acne one, I believe, kind of happened organically, and it's pretty great if you look at it. It's, it is, if I were like 15 years old and going through a little bit of a hormonal acne situation, I would have been really happy with it. All right, Eva, let's get to a speed round where we have random questions right. and I feel you like just kind of respond. So get ready, crack oh, your okay. knuckles. I'm like ner nervous. All right, best designer you've never heard of that, that you can only find through Instagram. Best designer you've never heard of that you can only find through Instagram. Um, oh, okay, so I met this designer when I was at a show in London. Her name is Frederica. She has a line called 16 Arlington. And basically the number 16 is spelled out. And she had direct messaged me a few times and I never got to meet her in person until I was in London. And then I kind of fell in love with her clothes. They're very Instagram friendly. It's like clothes covered in rhinestones and sequins. So when you move, you're like, it's like a Kira Kira dream. That's all I'm going to say. So I met her through Instagram, and she's this like very young designer, and I really like her. All right. What's her name again? Uh, Frederica. I, I just know her. As, I, I know people as usernames. I don't know if What's any of What's her username? 16 Arlington. The number 16 Arlington. Yeah. All right. Demystify Instagram for us a little bit. It, okay. there, there's an al or algorithm that organizes your feed. Yes or no? Yes. Can you game it? Can you game it? Um, 
Well, the way the algorithm works, it's, it, it's funny because people love saying algorithm because it sounds kind of like sexy and elusive and they'll be like, but the algorithm. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if the algorithm is to blame for the bad weather today, but you can, you know, people just like saying algorithm. Um, the way the algorithm works is actually really simple. Like we know that people, Instagram knows that people on average miss 70% of their feed. I follow over almost 1,200 accounts. I feel like I miss almost 90% of my feed just because I follow so many accounts and so many of the people I follow are like my friends who post nine to 10 times a day, mm -hmm. which is a lot. So Instagram, the algorithm basically, all it does is surface the content and the accounts that you engage with the most. So if you press the heart button or if you leave a comment, that's engagement. So everyone in this room could literally follow the same four accounts. Like let's just say you follow National Geographic, Kim Kardashian, your sister, and uh, there's an account called Jess Rona Grooming, J-E-S-S-R-O-N-A Grooming. It's a dog groomer in LA. You will be very happy you follow this account because she does slow-mo videos of dogs getting blowouts. So basically it's like a dog and its hair kind of wow. like blowing in the wind. Okay, so we could all follow those same four accounts and depending on what you're liking, like we'll all have a different experience. And that's the algorithm. So if you want to game the algorithm, it's just about getting more engagement. So post stuff that's authentic, that's real, that's you being you. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like having conversations with people who leave comments, like that's boosting engagement. So that's how you fake game the algorithm. It's really not like a real gaming system. And of course, hashtags make a huge difference. Yeah, hashtags are something like people are very opinionated on hashtags. I've done meetings with uh, European designers where they'll be like, Le hashtag, oh, so tacky, you know, like, oh, like, oh, sacre bleu. And I'm always like, oh, like, I love hash, I love a good hashtag. Hashtags are basically a way to tap into a community. So if you are a huge foodie, my friend Christine um, is a food blogger, and she, her Instagram is cy underscore eats, and she basically specializes in, like, the grossest, least healthy food ever. So she's posting, like, slow-mo videos of a grilled cheese, like, stretching, and basically it's, like, Horrible and great at the same, it's great, it's great, but um, I'm on this like clean diet, not diet, clean eating plan right now, so just like thinking about grilled cheese is make, giving me the shakes like of craving. Um, what, what, what hashtag does she use? She uses um, eats, she uses uh, cheat day eats, she uses like gr hashtag grilled cheese, mm -hmm. like there are grilled cheese enthusiasts, and nowadays you can follow hashtags as well. So. Do any of you guys follow slime or you know what slime is? It's like basically like kids are obsessed with making slime yeah. and then they like just like knead the slime and you just watch it like kind of in the, like a zombie like state for an hour. But it's like it's a great way to tap into a community. So you would be shocked by the number of pe people are like, oh, you know, and sometimes a designer will say this to me. They're like, oh, my office has a view of the Eiffel Tower and when the sun sets, it's so pretty, but everyone's seen the Eiffel Tower at sunset. It's like so basic. I mean, I wanted to do that in a French accent, by the way, but I did not want to, uh, like, you know, force you guys to listen to my horrible French accent again. So, but what you forget is that, like, a sunset is something that universally people appreciate. Paris is something that a lot of this designer's followers who might have one million followers will never visit. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a hashtag is a way to tap into a global experience, even if you are not part of it. And so that's why hashtag bookstagram or hashtag, like, you know, dogs of Instagram, daily fluff is a good one for, I, like, love an animal Instagram. So it's a good way to tap into, like, a collective kind of appreciation of something. What's a bad hashtag, then? I wouldn't say there's any bad hashtag, but I do think when people, for their caption, do every word as a hashtag, hashtag hi, hashtag how, hashtag are, hashtag you, mm -hmm. that hashtag good. bacon, hashtag lettuce, hashtag tomato. Just do hashtag BLT, that's enough. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like, I personally think like two to three hashtags is enough. All right, what community do you identify with? Because Instagram, Facebook, that's Silicon <laughs> Valley. You're here in New York, you're based here, so you could argue the tech scene, the fashion scene in New York, high fashion in Paris, in Milan, street fashion through a lot of the influencers and Instagram, where do you feel at home? I don't know, I feel like my life is like kind of like a Venn diagram of like all those things and I am like a tiny circle in the middle that I really like, I am secretly like a hermit who likes to stay at home and read my like teen books, but then I also like am out and about for my job a lot and I feel like that's like, 
the great thing about Instagram is that no matter what you like, there's, there's an aspect of it on Instagram that you can find and participate in. Which tech community has better style? Silicon Valley or New York? Oh God, like New York, obviously. <laughs> is, there, is that even a question? Like, there's so much fleece in Silicon Valley. Ah. Fleece yeah. is trending, Patagonia is chic. I'm like, Patagonia, I love you. <laughs> like, um, but um, New York, definitely, for sure. Based on what you've seen on Instagram, what's the next fashion trend that we should all pay attention oh, to? Oh gosh. Um, I mean, there was a lot that was kind of trending. Like, I think a lot of stuff has come up through Instagram, whether it's, you know, like uh, the sparkle lip trend. People are doing crazy things with their eyebrows and eyelashes now. Like, I think they're putting, like, Christmas trees. Like, Christy Dash would be able to advise on this. But, like, they're doing, like, crazy things. Like, mermaid hair was a thing. Um, I think right now what is, like, cool is just feeling comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that's, like, and I think that's something that's, like, trickled trickled up maybe from Silicon Valley is that like, I mean, I was wearing like kind of a sweatshirt earlier, but then I felt pressure to dress up for you guys because it's Bloomberg um, and Cornell. So I put a, like, I'm, this is my business lady look. Uh, but basically like, I do feel like feeling comfortable in your own skin is like the most important thing right now. You say you read about 10 kids books uh, a night with your yes. daughter, Ren. Yes. So what's the name of the book that you are going to write one day? Because you said that's all training for when you do write a book. Yeah. Um, can't say. I'm Can't working. Say I'm working say. on a little, a little thing, for, like a book for my daughter right now. Oh, so, children's yeah. book. Yeah. Fashion related? Um, not unfashion related. <laughs> Being so cryptic, I love it. Like, trying to get the scoop. All right. What Instagram tip would you give Anna or Anna Wintour? Join. <laughs> um, she has not gotten on. How Amanda, about you again. join Instagram, Anna Anna? Um, no, I. Um, I feel like she has a lot on her plate right now, and I would not, I, d I understand why maybe she is not publicly on it. Okay. Let's open things up to the audience who have a lot of questions. Um, we have a roving microphone. Gentleman over here. Uh, good evening, Eva. Uh, wow. My name is Benny. <laughs> I want to ask Can you, you narrate my children's book. <laughs> Damn. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I love this guy. In 30 days, yes. what have you? Uh, what What's the best way to increase your following okay. on Instagram besides is, my sexy voice? You, yeah. No, I'm not even kidding. You need to post videos of your sexy voice. <laughs> I am like transfixed. Like we need to get his username and immediately like, okay, so growing your Instagram following is probably the question I get the most, right? Like people, whether they have 5,000 followers or 5 million followers, everyone wants more followers. The equation is actually like, is not that hard. It is, but it, it's not hard. It's just like, it sounds more complicated. Number one, post more. A lot of people will say something like, well, I don't want to annoy my followers. I don't want to seem like desperate. I don't want to post more than like once a week because I want to be mysterious. Like, if you don't post, you're not giving people stuff to engage with. The average person, like the average fashion follower at least, follows hundreds of accounts. Like, I, I've very rarely seen a fashion follower who follows less than like 300 accounts. If they follow someone who posts nine times a day, if they follow one Instagrammer, Instagrammer or one celebrity who posts nine times a day and you only post once a week, they're probably not even seeing your content. So Instagramming is like a muscle that you need to exercise. Try to post at least once a day, I would say. For you, I would utilize stories. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I think for stories, like what people expect from, like stories helps, often helps people loosen up their, on their Instagram a bit. Like it, it, they just, you start having more fun with it. People love content that's shot on an iPhone, so don't feel like it has to be perfect. And remember, I mean, I assume you live in New York City, right? Like you live here in New York. You live in one of the most photogenic cities in the world. Like share it. It might be graffiti on the side of the street. It might be you, you know, in front of the Flatiron Building. Share your experience. And for you, I would, I would use hashtags as well. Like people don't want to use hashtags, hashtag NYC, and use the geo tag so people can discover you. All right, next question from... This woman over here at the on the aisle. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks for coming. So I've heard that Instagram rewards people who use the full suite of things. You know, what, if you're using stories, a is that true? But then also, I think a lot of bloggers have been talking about shadow banning, and if that's real, wait, what's um, shadow banning? 
So can you answer that question? Well, you know, yes, and I think it I goes can. in line with like how many hashtags am I being shadow banned? Or? Okay. The first thing is like if Instagram awards people who use the full suite of tools, like I sign me up for that award because uh, I, I think that what do you mean by award? Like it, we like a oh, rewards. Yeah, so if you're using stories and posting that you'll probably beat the algorithm by just putting no, yourself out I there mean, more. Like back the to main, the algorithm. Yeah, it's back to the algorithm. The main thing is that if you use the full suite, like if you use stories and feed and you're doing lives, you're kind of, you're surfacing your content to people the most ways possible, which means like, so Instagram, like for stories, you can, people can only see 200 stories at a time. Those little bubbles up top, only 200 of them show up. And the more you post the stories, just the more likely the people are to watch it. The more likely people are to, to watch it, the more to the front of the tray that you go. When you do an Instagram Live, you automatically go to the front. So it's like, it's not that like Instagram's rewarding you, it's just you are rewarding yourself and creating behavior that will help people see your content so that they can engage with it. And the more people can engage with it, the more like other people will see your content and explore. We don't, by the way, program Explorer. That's like a myth. People are like, can you get me into the Explore page? Everyone here, I guarantee you, has a different Instagram Explore page because it's based on what you and your friends are pressing the like button on. In terms of shadow banning, shadow banning is another one of those like sexy, mysterious words like uh, algorithm that people just like saying and they like blaming everything on shadow banning. So shadow banning, basically, it's like, it was like a theory that people were saying that like we were blocking certain hashtags um, and people would say like you're shadow banning my hashtag, you're preventing my stuff from being seen. Mm -hmm. And what it was is that there was a bug which Instagram like did release like I feel like if not a press release there was a statement about it at some point on some service on the there was a blog post about it. And basically it was like a glitch that happened and then that's when the shadow banning meme happened. What I will say is that if you are leaving hashtags or comments, so shadow banning does not exist. If you are leaving comments and hashtags and you're leaving at them at such a high velocity, like I do think that they flag you in the system. So I'm literally talking about if you leave 50 comments in like 30 seconds, like Instagram thinks you're a spammer. Uh. You know what I mean? But I don't know humanly how you could do that unless you had 46 fingers. Like, typing like that. So um, so I do think like spam flagging and that's to keep the community kind of safe from spam. So post more but don't comment really quickly. No, you should in a comment lot of, but like literally if you like 150 picture, I, I mean and I, I like how I'm saying like don't quote me on this where there's a camera and like 250 people in the room. But like if you are posting, if you are leaving hundreds of comments in like a matter of seconds which again like I don't know how you would do that. Mm -hmm. And if you do, tell me, like, um, it, it would send a flag in the system. We've seen this with, like, certain um, brands where, that get a lot of queries about, like, uh, where is this mascara available? How much is it? And they're responding to comments so quickly that it has flagged the system. But they're, they're, they're typing really fast, and I don't think a normal user would be able to do that. Have there been any fake Instagram accounts by, by questionable people where that you know of? Yeah, I mean, like, Instagram, I mean, like, spam exists. Like, you know, there are bots that exist. And I think that Instagram takes keeping the, com keeping the community kind of, like, uh, strong and real really seriously. And they're cleaning out spam accounts, like, literally every single day. Okay, question from this side of the audience? Anyone? Gentleman in the front row? Hi, my name is Arjun, like Argentina without the Tina. Oh. Um, at Arjun Rai ME is my Instagram. My quick question to you is shout out. <laughs> my my quick question to you is for me, mentors have been very important. Yeah. Uh, in my career, I started at 17 with my first startup. For you, who do you look up to? Who do you owe your career to? Oh gosh. Um, for me, I would say first, I would say my mom, just as a working woman and moving here and emigrating here in the, with my dad and see, having a role model like my mother and seeing how hard she worked to provide me and my brother with everything we had. That's my like OG original role model and I do hope that when my daughter one day looks back and oh my god I'm not gonna cry let me suck the tears back in but one day when she looks back I hope she realizes that like that's why I work so hard to try to give her that foundation too. Um, I think in my career there have been so many people who have given me chances like 
the first beauty editor that I worked with um, who kind of helped spark that love of beauty and writing for me. Um, her name was Emily, she was, her name was Emily Doherty and I worked for her at Elle. Then I went to Teen Vogue and Amy Astley, the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, who now is editor-in-chief of Arch Architectural Digest. She gave me, I think it's important to work for people who give you a lot of freedom and trust in your taste and trust in your abilities and let you kind of like, I don't want to say like fly blind, but kind of let you explore what you can do. And Amy definitely let me kind of like be creative. And then um, Anna Anna, who, uh, <laughs> Uh, Anna Anna, who just kind of like helped me grow so much as an editor and even now is such an amazing uh, kind of resource and source of advice for me. How often do you talk to Anna Anna? Anna Anna, uh, we don't, it's like we're not like texting BFF or anything, but if I know, I mean, that's one of the things. It's like people always, there's definitely a kind of image or stereotype, but she's like super warm. She has an extremely dry sense of humor. Her one-word emails are very directional yet uh, uh, clear so uh, and funny. So it's like I know that if – I feel fortunate in that if I need to, she's there. And now I feel like at Instagram, our COO is this amazing woman, Marnie Levine. And it's like I, she is such an amazing leader. And seeing the way she balances many things and the way she thinks about things is very different for me because she's very, like, clear and analytical. And I am completely ruled not – by that I'm like just like always like a ball of emotions so like Marnie is someone amazing to kind of see as a role model or, or a leader within the organization and the leader the woman who oversees the partnerships entire partnerships team globally mm -hmm. is also a woman who just had her third child and she like runs like biathlons on the weekends and I'm literally like in awe of her as well uh, another question uh, in the back over there age of Amazon and so-called rumors that retail is dying. What is your advice uh, to companies, large and small, to build an exciting and profitable uh, brand overall? Um, first of all, thank you for standing for this entire session, and I hope you're wearing flat <laughs> shoes. Uh, I would say, I mean, it's definitely not my core expertise, but in terms of building a business, I just think it comes down to the product. I think it's actually... If you're a small business and you're doing something cool and, and you have a story to tell, I think that's something that sets you apart from anyone else. And I think that kind of reveling in your own voice and not being afraid to tell your story and not trying to be someone else, I think that's the most important thing. Um, I talk to a lot of small business owners in my job and I hear their stories about how they started. I think about the brand Glossier, the makeup brand, who kind of created a beauty product that's like, there are thousands of beauty products. There are thousands of brow gels. But like they kind of saw something that was missing, like boy brow, and they launched that. Or like, just like if you see something missing and you're doing that and you're telling your story in a compelling way, I think that's the most important thing you can do. Another question back there, uh, standing. So as an influencer yourself and really truly living in the social media world, how do you find a balance of disconnecting and putting your phone down and kind of just stepping away? Oh, good question. I like how like I say this and my phone is like like right next to me. Um, I don't know. I just I get asked that question a lot of like how do you detox? And for me, it's like I I actually really love Instagramming. And when I don't Instagram, I feel kind of like oh man, I didn't have time to Instagram today. Like I really enjoy it personally. I understand when people want to take a break from anything, whether it's carbs or whether it's like, you know, uh, New York City or whatever it is that you want to take a break from, people should. Like you should live your best life and have breaks from whatever it is. Mother-in-law, whatever it is you, you, you need a break from. I think that um, for me, it's just like, I just do it. I don't think too hard about it. Like on weekends, it's always really crazy because it's like two kids and like trying to get stuff done, like go to the dry cleaner and like pick this up and do that and run this errand and make this doctor's appointment. And so sometimes on the weekends, I'm not able to post as much during the day. And I just, I try not to overthink it, I guess. Um, yeah. That said, it's like, I don't, it, I don't post on Instagram for a living, even though I work. I didn't, does that make, you know what I mean, right? I'm not like a blogger who has to post 10 times a day because she has 10 outfit posts she needs to get through. So maybe the burden is a little bit lighter for me. Gentleman over here. Hey, um, we have a mic uh, coming to you. 
obviously brands, there are a lot of brands <laughs> on Instagram, and the FTC has looked at brands on Instagram and sort of, you know, try to figure out how they should, you know, what kind of disclosure is required. What are your feelings on that? Is there, you know, you're an Instagram star, you're getting paid to add, to, to post branded content. What, wh well, how should that play out in your feed? Um, I think that the most important thing, okay, so the people who become Instagram stars are often the ones who have the most original voice, right? And are like the most themselves and feel comfortable being themselves, ideally, right? And I think that the ones that do it really well, like I look at, there's a uh, Instagrammer named Leandra Medine, man repeller, who like I see like many knowing nods, usually the girls who are wearing like loafers and like awkward hem lengths. Yes, yes, get it. <laughs> Sorry, I just started watching uh, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, and my response to everything is like, yes, yes, get it. Um, okay, so I feel like the ones who have done really well are the ones who are able to like be themselves, as I said earlier, and just like post about things organically and not like try to like sneak in things. Like a lot of the influencers I talk to like love the branded um, content tool on Instagram and being able to say like in partnership with because it just like takes out any question marks. Um, I do think it's like something the FTC, as you said, is takes really seriously. Instagram is taking it really seriously. And so if you work for a brand that's like gifting influencers, you should definitely put that little thing in that says like use hashtag gifted by Cartier or wherever, you know, like, you know, I think being very clear. But I also believe that we're in a generation that kind of grew up with it. Like a lot of the people on Instagram who are 13 to 34, like they grew up in a day and age where like people were talking about fit tea on a reality show or you know different things that they were being paid to so i don't know if the sensitivity is as high there I personally i don't think the sensitivity is as high so there it doesn't phase them i don't think branded content phases them personally from like what what i what i've heard from when i talk to a lot of like 25 year olds i don't think they care if the content is authentic it's in the voice it normally would be and it doesn't feel like a sellout. I think if it's something they would be talking about anyway, it's fine. Consistent with the with the brand, right? Yeah. Consistent with the origin of yeah. the brand. Okay. Uh, final question. Over here in the third row. Hi. Um, so with any change, uh, there is the initial initial negative reaction or just the like, oh, why is this happening? Um, you know, when the landscape and portrait ver crops came out and the stories came out, but then came with the feed, um, which was originally chronological, and then mm -hmm. it changed, and now there's a little rollback of bringing it back to chronological. At what point do you guys decide from a business standpoint to listen to, I guess, the, the large influencers on this platform or even just the overall population on this platform to say, okay, I guess they're right. Maybe we should kind of readjust this change or, you right. know, rather than just going with it and hoping everyone follows through. Well, um, so the Instagram team did extensive research. And so we know that people miss 70% of their feed. So you as an influencer, I don't know how that affects you personally, but most people actually like seeing the content from their sis like it used to be that like if kim kardashian decided to drop or let's use kanye as an example this is an actual real life example so if kanye west decides to drop 56 pictures of couples throughout history and literally post that and your sister had a baby and it was chronological and Ka kanye west decided to drop that you wouldn't see your sister's baby which would be really really sad for you mis to miss the birth of your niece by the way um <laughs> and so really sad you should regret that but basically that's how chronological feed worked right it was just basically purely based on time and so we knew that 70 percent of people or people were missing 70 percent of the feed basically the algorithm there there was a test at one point where they were testing posts as old as seven days and that's because like if you the guy with the amazing, deep, sonorous voice was only posting once a week to be elusive. Like, basically, if Instagram, if you were engaging with his posts, even if it was seven days old, you would see his post. And recently, we did just announce what you were referencing. We're doing, it's not chronological again, but the posts are within two days now. And so it's a, it's a test. Instagram's constantly changing. They do, I will say, the management really, really, and the executive team really, really listens to feedback. So, I mean, this was feedback that was surfaced over and over again. 
But I will say anecdotally from most people, like most normal users, I, I very rarely hear questions about the algorithm and chronological. Oh. It's like the super influencers who are like, but oftentimes they're happy too because they get their content seen more even if it's not the freshest. All right, Eva Chen, thank you so much. Before, before you guys get up, I want to bring up Ben Vick, uh, a student from Cornell Tech, to give us our closing remarks. Oh. Ben. Thank you, Scarlett, as always, for hosting and moderating for us. And thank you, Eva, for being with us and sharing your time and experience this evening. Uh, my name is Ben Vick. I'm a current MBA student at Cornell Tech. I wanted to quickly share just three takeaways uh, from the conversation that we just heard. First, there's no wasted experience in life. And when you have a bad experience, think about what you're going to take away from it bring it and bring it to your next job or your next experience. Second, focus on being authentic, whether you're an influencer, a major brand, or Eva herself. Find ways to showcase what's unique and special about you. And third, there's something we can all learn from the fashion industry's willingness to be messy and embrace diversity. I wanted to close just by saying that experiences like this are huge for the student experience at Cornell Tech and for everything that we're trying to do in New York. If you haven't come yet to see our beautiful, and I will say Instagram-worthy uh, <laughs> campus on Roosevelt Island, I highly encourage you to take the tram uh, or the train and come and see us. Thanks again.